Good morning, people of God. How are you all doing this morning? Listen, I don't have my co-host with me this morning. Okay, my co-host is not with me. That's Apostle James Duncan. Um, and so he'll be with us tomorrow. But uh, as you come in, okay, this is the prophetic voice of victory. As you come in, I want you to comment, like, and share. Let me know that you're here. Say good morning. And for some of you all around the world, it might be a good afternoon. It might be a good evening. Okay, but where I'm at is a good morning. So if you can just greet me, good morning, I would appreciate it. Okay, so let me start off by saying my name is Mercy Mars Jenkins. Okay, so this morning it's myself. Okay, and so I'm feel I'm, I'm gonna be honest, I'm feeling slightly odd. Okay, I'm feeling slightly odd at this time because I'm on my own. Okay, but I know I'm not on my own, I know you guys are with me. Okay, and you're gonna be great company for me this morning. All right, okay, <laughs> I'm gonna just quickly just ping people and let them know that we're here. Okay, so. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God is good this morning. Yes, so you are here for the prophetic voice of victory this morning. So we're here. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's good to see you all. All right, we're going to get into it. I'm on my own this morning, but we're going to get into it, okay? And so um, we're going to be talking, first of all, Happy Black History Month. I'm wearing my fro t-shirt that says, we're supposed to be in the room. Okay, people of God, we're supposed to be in the room. We're supposed to be in the building, as they say. Okay, pull up, create your own table, or get to the platform, take you a seat, or create your own seat. Whichever way, whichever way it goes down, okay, people of God, let's make sure that we're in the room we're in the building and the Holy Ghost is in control. Amen. All right. So let me just do this right now because I'm, 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 I'm a little under the weather, but it's all good. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. Okay. So celebrating Black History Month. We are, for this month, we're going to be delving into some things concerning concerning um celebrating um black um uh, personalities in the bible highlighting them and also just raising this issue and let me tell you something when apostle james duncan talked about it i was like eh, i don't even want to do that okay i'll just be honest right very rarely very oh god um very rarely oh god this dog this dog <laughs> My God, stop. Okay, you're oh. not gonna do that. No. God. Let me get one of my kids. Oh, I know, I know what it is. My, 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 my kids are all that right now. Hold on. This doggy want to go out. That's what it is. It's this doggy time to go out. I apologize. This is so embarrassing. I gotta call my son to come get this dog. Hello? This thing, come and get this dog. I'm on live and this dog is disturbing me. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you, Jesus. At least I can get it under control now. Praise the Lord. Okay, so listen. I was like, do we even want to go there? Okay. Um, because race, talking about race, talking about um, but um African American or black, I say black. Okay, I'm used to saying black. I'm, I'm not American, so it's kind of weird for me saying African American. I'm just gonna be honest, right? Okay, so it's uh, you know, as a Christian, let me say this: as a Christian, I was taught never to talk about race. Okay, uh, almost like it's irrelevant. It there's no there's no there's no place for it. And the fact that if you talk about it, right, is you're doing a dishonor to Christ because his blood was red and his blood covers us all, okay? And so there's no need, okay, to identify 
with your blackness or the black struggle, okay? That's how I was informed when I first became a Christian, okay? Which was like 20 years ago, all right? And that has always been a conflict for me because I'll tell you why. I was into, um, I was an Afrocentric um, individual, okay? So I'm first generation British, okay? British born and raised. And so um, my parents are from Ghana, West Africa. So that's where we're from. We would say that we're Ghana in, okay? And so I was very much into wanting to travel. You know, I went to Kenya and I wanted to do the whole South Africa tour. And that was me, like, when, when God was like, America, I'm like, uh huh? Because I, I didn't really identify with that, right? I identified more with wanting to hang out and be with my people's dead, okay? That was just me, right? But here's the thing, and we're going to talk about oppression. Here's the thing. Partly what that had to do with is racism, okay? Partly the desire to only be with my people is racism. Again, why is that racism? It's racism because it's about, I only feel safe. It's about as an issue of safety, which then exposes an issue of oppression, okay? I only feel safe amongst my own. I only know my own. I don't, I don't want to invest in being around other people. I only know my own, okay? And that's where the safety is, right? I, I'm raised in England and, you know, the oppression and um, the discrimination is an institutionalized racism is pretty deep over there, okay? It's really deep, okay? Um, and so over here, I feel like it's definitely less by far, okay? It's a big stark difference, but it's still here. It's still here. Okay. And so um, yesterday, Apostle was talking about immigration and how God uses immigration to transport his people. Okay. Transport them to a geographical location where they're blessed. We see that with Joseph, his family was able to get to Goshen. Okay. They were able to get to Goshen, which was them migrating from one place to another. That happened because of the famine, but it also happened because Joseph was transported first. He was the forerunner first, okay? And so forerunner means that you go ahead, okay? And you go ahead and you set a place for the others to follow, okay? And so that's like ancestral, okay? So the people, the ancestors go first and the rest of the people follow. And so we know that uh, black people was transported to various different places, okay? to the Caribbean, to England, to America, predominantly in America, we was transported here by the vehicle, <clears throat> by the vehicle of slavery. And it was through that transitionary period that they also indoctrinated us in their religion, which was Christianity. Okay. And so we thank God for that part. But there's so many different uh, nuances that happen that really affects the psyche. And so we was focusing on Psalm 103, verse 6, that God said he executes judgment for the oppressed. And he's on, that he um, favors, okay, you know, there's two sides. You've got the oppressed and the oppressor. So he favors, okay, the oppressed, okay? And so... What we realize is, or what we know, I should say, as individuals in your experience, most people would say, yes, that as a group, as a people, that we are oppressed. There's a struggle, okay? And it happens on various different levels, okay? And so there's three levels of oppression that I want you to think about, three levels, okay? So there's an individual level, okay? There's a level that happens on an individual basis. There's a level that happens on an institutional basis, okay? Individual, institutional, and there's a level that's relational, okay? Relational is in relationships, okay? It could be domestic violence, okay? It can be parental abuse, all right? Uh, it, it can be adult abuse, okay? So those are the three levels, individual, okay? And I want us to think about the individual abuse, all right? The individual abuse is where, like, for example, look what just happened, yeah, to Mr. Nichols. Um, I believe it's Troy Nichols, right? If I'm saying that wrong, put his name in the chat. 
first of all, let me say good morning to you all. Good morning. I see you all. I see you, Brother Dewey. I see you, Maureen. I see you, Dr. Myra, uh, Lorna, uh, T.J. Carton. I see you all. Uh, Stephanie, Providence Stephanie. I see you, Brother Darius. I see you all in the room. Providence Andrea and Sister Novelat. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. So what we just witnessed, okay, uh, with the black officers, what we just witnessed, and they could be even Christians, but what we just witnessed, in my mind, internalized racism. That's what I call it. Yes, it's internalized racism. It is when you turn inward and you absorb the racist um discriminations against yourself, the labeling, the stereotyping, you feed off of it, you become it, and you make very poor decisions like, like they did. They're in a place of power, even though they're in the place of power and they wore the badge, they internalized the racism and became a part of the system. Okay, they internalized it and became a part of that very dark, culture why couldn't they go in and say listen us being represented creates a safe place for the community okay and that community had a large proportion of african americans in that community okay and so even though there was um high crime that task force okay was predominantly black their leadership was predominantly black yes the the the, the right the the, the institution has racism, has racist policies and so forth. And the injustice system is um, extremely racially biased. So we know that, yeah. But the, the thought is, is that it's still a safe place for the community. But why was it not a safe place? Because one, they still internalized racism and they are still being, um, they're still, working in an institutionalized racist um, institution that's still feeding and training them, okay? And so there is a mechanics that's going on that it's still perpetuating, even though you would think it is a safe place. It's still been perpetuated, okay? And here's the thing, so it is in that system, so it is in Christianity. Yes, I said it. And so it is in Christianity. We just don't talk about it. But let me tell you something. When 2020 rolled around, okay, and there was that um, young man, um, um, George Floyd, when that happened, th I, that was the first time ever, first time ever I had began to see in Christendom, in the body of Christ, it was my first time. Maybe you guys have seen it. I don't know. Okay, some of you guys are older saints, but it was my first time that I had actually seen that race was being addressed in the body of Christ. Okay, it was the first time, okay, that it was openly being addressed and discussed. Okay, and discussed. All right, it was on the agenda. It was my first time seeing it because I had seen some things. And I was always wondering, when is these issues really going to really come out, out of the woodwork? Because there is a lot of racial bias going on. And I'm going to say it in the prophetic. Yes, I said it in the prophetic. I've seen it in the prophetic. I've seen it in prophetic streams uh, that, that carry a mighty, a mighty ministry, carry mighty power and demonstration of the power and the Holy Ghost and all of that. But the racial bias just gets in the way. Okay. And they skip over people. They overlook because they're still attached to those stigmas concerning race. They still are holding on to the labeling that they have done as part of the community at large. Okay, as the community at large. So even though there is people in their organization, I'm talking about their denomination or in their houses that they have raised up to be great men and women of God, there wasn't a transference of promotion. There wasn't a, um, a recognition, okay, that they should have got because 
the individuals were still, or the boards were still attached, still attached to their racial bias and they couldn't let it go. But let me tell you something, in 2020, I had seen Bishop Bill Hammond, I'm saying this publicly because he came out publicly, Bishop Bill Hammond, who was the vehicle for why I came to the States in the first place, okay, our Christian International Ministry Network in Florida, okay, he is a major forerunner, in fact, he is um, dubbed the um, father of the prophetic um, movement, he is the modern day father of the prophetic movement, he addressed the issue, okay, and I ain't seen anybody address the issue. He had addressed the issue, okay, of race because it was something that he personally said he struggled with and it is in his organization and he took a stance that time to deal with it. And I thought that was a brave move because I ain't seen anybody do that. I thought that was a brave move, okay, because uh, there is a lot of racism that goes on in those circles, but it was a brave move for him to put it out and to get um, other people involved in the discussion, okay? To get black people involved in the discussion to actually air it out, okay? And I believe that's what God wants to do. I believe he wants to air it out. Why? And I'm bringing this all in, okay? We've been talking about oppression, okay? We've been talking about oppression. Oppression is abuse, it's harm, and we know abuse and harm is on various different levels. It could be financial, okay? It can be spiritual, okay? Spiritual abuse, racial abuse, okay? Sexual abuse, all right? So, you know, even housing, okay? Housing abuse. So abuse can happen in any area of your life, okay? Any area of your life. Applying for college, okay? Applying for college, Um and even with this guy right here, you know, just a, a, a traffic stop, okay? So it permeates in every part of society, okay? And it's not to be ignored. This is something that needs to be rooted out. And we have to speak it out so that it can be rooted out. We have to speak it out on various levels. We have to first deal with the mind, okay? We need to be renewed in our minds in the way that we think about ourselves, okay? And so um, Psalms 103 verse six lets us know that God is on the side. He takes favor with the oppressed, okay? And we know that we're oppressed on three levels, individually, which I like to say internally, okay? That we internalize, all right? We internalize, um, if, if somebody's going through sexual abuse, they internalize the shame, okay? Or racial abuse or spiritual abuse, they internalize it, okay? When I was dealing with spiritual abuse, and I also done put a whole spin on that, okay? Because he said, that's the occult. And I was like, hmm, he's actually right. It wasn't a, I, I say it's a cult, but he said occult. It was a witch's coven. I was like, you're right. Because the powers they moved in wasn't like a cult. It was demonic powers and entities. So he was right. I was like, okay, that's pretty deep. I had to get my head around that one. I was like, okay. Right. So, um, oh, somebody said, how can I purchase one of your books? Um, you can purchase any of my books. My books are on Amazon. Okay. So you can certainly get any of my books on Amazon. If you do, please tag me, let me know what you think of my books. Okay. But, um, but yes, any of my stories right now, they're on Amazon, most certainly. Um, what was I going to say? I do have a book here if you're interested. And I know, Maureen, we're in the same area. So I can always drop it off to you too as well. Okay. And yeah, so if you want to do that, we can do that. Hey, Jessica, it's good to see you, Jessica. <laughs> it's good to see you. Good morning, Claire. Good morning, Pastor Bishop. It's good to have you. All right, so let me get back on track now. So God is on the side of the oppressor. We suffer oppression on three levels. Individually, I like to say internally. Institutionally, that means the systems um, in society, okay? And then relationally, in between relationships, okay? What we have to do is this, is understand and learn 
that uh, uh, abuse, one of the things that abuse does is it invokes, it invokes a feeling. And I want to introduce this word to you. It invokes something, okay? And the danger that it does when it invokes this word is what keeps you chained up, okay? That's what perpetual is to chain. So this weapon is extremely powerful, okay? It is a weapon. Okay, and so we have to be we have to really understand this weaponry of how the enemy continues to keep us in bondage. We had talked about the wickedness of the wicked. We had talked about the wickedness of Joseph and his brothers and how they oppressed him. And then we started to talk about, but why did they do that, though? Same thing with these um, police officers. Why did they do that, though? Okay, we need to think about why before we judge. Okay, well, we can judge. But what I'm saying is, let's not forget to ask the question, why? Get to the root, okay? And so the why is important because that's how we can unravel, untie ourselves and free ourselves. Because this is about freedom, people of God. We want to be free. And like I said, when I became a Christian, instead of allowing or teaching to embrace the various sides of who you are, okay, we was told to kill the blackness. Do not identify with the black struggle, okay? It's all Christ, okay? Whereas everybody else gets to be themselves. And, you're right, I mean, it's, it's just very discombobulating to say you don't exist in the world with this race, okay? We don't see race, okay? It's just the blood of Jesus that colors you. Right. And, you know, cutting off your identity. I mean, we've already been through that. Like, core. Cool. Like, we've already been through this. OK. My name is Mercy. My name should not be Mercy. My name should be F1 Burden. OK. Colonialism. OK. So my name's Mercy because a lot of the Catholic nuns, mercy, charity, blessings. OK. We're, in other words, stripping of the identity. OK. And so even in Christendom, we have to be very careful to be able to hold the mind, soul, body, and spirit. Those are all different parts, but we want wholeness. We don't want fragmentation, okay? Fragmentation is where witchcraft comes in, okay? So we don't want to be fragmented. We don't want splits, okay? That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for wholeness, bringing the whole identity together, okay? And so... This is the word that I want to share with you, okay? And the word is, quite frankly, shame, S-H-A-M-E. This is a very dangerous weapon when used against you. What is shame? I know we don't really think about it in this way, but last week God began to minister to me about this one word, okay? About this one word, shame. And if you're here, put it in the comments, shame, okay? This one word, shame. And he gave me a scripture in the Psalms that David himself said, God, bring, I'm going to read the scriptures. Let me, let me go to the scriptures because I'm going to show you how powerful this word is. Okay. Psalms 6 and 10. Psalms 6 and 10. King James Version says, let all my enemies be what? Ashamed and sore vexed. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly. My God. Like David was going in. Okay. This is what he wanted for his enemies. Right. He could have said, God, let them fall on the sword. Right. Um, and, and, and he said that in different places. But this place, he said, let my enemies be ashamed and sore vexed. Now I'm going to read that in another version. NIV. NIV says this. All my enemies will be what? Overwhelmed with shame and anguish. They will turn back and suddenly be put to shame. Okay? New Living Translation says this. My, may all my enemies be disgraced and terrified. May they suddenly turn back in shame. So we see shame being used twice here. Okay? And so... Uh, he wants them to be overwhelmed. Think about when you're tormented, how overwhelmed you may feel of being ashamed, right? Uh, 
if you have a secret sin, you feel so ashamed that guess what it does? You stop showing up. You don't show up. You When you're feeling some type of way, okay, think about it. When you're feeling some type of way, you might not pray. You might not fast because you feel some. You might get caught up in a sin or maybe you uh, got caught up in some lust, uh, entangled relationship. Maybe you um, cheated on your spouse and you feel some type of way. Now you just want to hide. You don't want to see nobody. You started a business and it failed, it flopped. Now all of a sudden, you don't want to go back and start your business, okay? You don't want to talk about business, all right? You just feel so low, okay? Maybe you was in a talent competition and as a child and you messed up on the stage and everyone started laughing. You was embarrassed, humiliated, you walked off and you said, I'll never do that again. I don't like public speaking for nothing. Okay. And all up until now, God is trying to get you to be a preacher. And you're like, I'm not doing it because I felt ashamed. I felt shame. What is shame? Extreme embarrassment. When you feel extreme embarrassment, you're like, you're so overwhelmed. You're like, it, 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 I, it paralyzes you. You just paralyze. You can't do nothing. You don't want to do nothing. You're like, I, I don't want to do nothing. I don't want to show up because last time, and these are the unconscious stories that's going on, okay? So this is the weaponry. David is saying, let them be so ashamed that they will never even come back even to even test us again. Like send them back suddenly. Let them be ashamed to twice that they even tried to even test me. Like they even try to even come after the children of Israel. Let them go back. Like let them go back with disgrace and dishonor. Dishonor them in their own community. Let them be undermined by their people. Their people's like, chat, yeah, we, we ain't even studying you, chat. We're not even following you. Like, chat, you ain't got nothing for us. Okay. Let them be disgraced. That they'll turn around and they've got no supporters, like no supporters, like nobody's following them. Their influence, their power, gone, gone. Okay, everything gone. Okay, and so uh, that's what David was saying, <laughs> right? That's what that's what David was actually saying, right? That's what he wanted because if you think about it. Once that happens, it's less of a fight for you, okay? You have to do less fighting, okay? The devil has to do less fighting if he gets you caught up in shame, okay? You, you, now, you're doing all the work. Oh, I don't think God wants to do that. Oh, I can't see. Oh, all of a sudden, you're blind, you're deaf, and we can't get you moving, okay? You, you're blind and deaf, you can't see, because shame can really block your view. Okay, it can, it can stop, paralyze, and anything and everything. It will get you deprogrammed into another program. Okay, it will stop and block you. Okay, it will hinder you. All right, so that is the power of shame. If you get humiliated, if you feel rejected, let me tell you, shame and rejection, my God. Okay, these weapons, when they start stacking up, you just like, you're like, oh, forget it. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be that. Okay. Now, here's the deal. When it comes to racial profiling, it's all about the labeling. That's what it's about. It's about the labeling. And that's a part of shame. Part of shame is I feel bad because I'm labeled one of them. Okay. People see me and they see that. Okay. And they label me as that. Okay. Labeling can be very self-destructive. When you absorb that energy, it can destroy your soul, okay? People with mental illness, okay? When they've been labeled schizophrenic or labeled manic depressive or, you know, like Kanye, the crazy one right now, labeling can really destroy somebody's level of self-esteem. And that has to do with shame, okay? People feel shame because they're being, you know, distinguished as something and, and they don't know how to get rid of that label. You know, you got to work hard to get rid of that label. Okay, because you're like, I'm nothing like that label. 
Okay, and that can push people to the other side. Like this group of men, oh no, no, you, you, you don't even know what kind of psychological games they play in the force. Oh, just because you're black, we feel like you're going to be softer than black people. So we've we've got to be the team that lets the rest of the boys in blue know that we're not going to be soft in our community. Okay, that is internalized racism. Those thoughts in itself is racism being permeated, right, to themselves, against themselves, okay? It's a form of self-rejection. It's a form of hating yourself, hating yourself, hating your people. So what does racism come to do? Dehumanize. So now these officers dehumanize themselves and they dehumanize others, right? Because we're supposed to love our, our, our neighbor as we love ourselves. If you stop loving yourself, and they go home to work and they feel bad for who they are because of the boys in blue and large outside of their, their precinct. And these policies and, 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 and these emails coming out, oh, you know, you guys' territory or, you, you know, your quotas or whatever. Then they want to prove themselves. Now, I'm, this is all hypothetical, by the way. This is just how my brain is just working, okay? This ain't, this ain't kosher. Uh, but this is just some of my thoughts. When I heard that they were black, I ain't even seen no pictures. I ain't seen no videos. I don't want to even see it, okay? Because um, I can't stomach it, okay? But I appreciate that it is in the news. I appreciate it is in the news and that it needs to be in the news. I do appreciate that because we cannot turn a blind eye. But in Christendom, we've got to do the same thing too. Okay, we have to admit that we don't ordain. There's some communities I'm in and I've seen that is predominantly white. Their staff, they don't promote. Um, their leadership, they don't promote them. They can stay an elder for like forever. And I'm I'm talking about people that that are prophetic people that are in, that should be in the office of one of the five folks. Okay, and I've seen how they just won't do it, okay, because of race, okay? I've seen the racism in those organizations, okay? It's, I'm not making this up. And like I said, Bishop Hammond himself came on live and he admitted and then confessed to how he had a racial bias and there was a racial bias that he was now addressing in him and in his organization. And I commended him. In fact, I actually reposted it and i was like great because i had seen it there okay they are phenomenal in terms of going to the nations and doing the missionary work hands down you can't say none okay but at the home base in america hmm, like he said there was some racial bias okay but i give him props i give him props because he is a forerunner and because he is talking about it and so I like that. Okay. And so I give him props. Okay. So we'll come back to the top of the hour. Let me just go ahead and see uh, where we are with these comments. Okay. Because we love the comments people award. Okay. I love the comments. Hi, Freddie. Right. Sounds on point to me. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Darius. I have an amen in the corner. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> That is hilarious. Yes, uh, Darius, it is shame. Okay, so I want you guys to be thinking about that because we have a tendency to judge people and to say, I would never do that. Let me tell you something about the Holy Ghost. He showed me a very prominent prophet, very prominent and very endorsed. And I had a dream that he had his wife, he kissed his wife, he turned around, and he kissed this chick. And he had women, naked women in his house on all fours. It was like a brothel. And I was like, and I wanted to learn from this person. And God was like, you need to stop. Because I kept on like, I'm like, God, I don't know why you keep telling me no. And then God was like, this is why I'm telling you no. And I was like, cool. Like, I would never do that. And the Holy Ghost told me, you lying. Like, why are you making judgments? Because you lying. Okay? You would. And I was like, no, I've never cheated on my husband. Like, 
Like you, I've never done that. We don't do that in our marriage, right? I've never cheated my husband. And this is what the Holy Ghost said to me. He said, you've never been tested. And I was like, boom. I was like, okay. Booyah. Okay, touche, touche. Jesus, okay, I got you. I hear you. <laughs> I have never been tested to a level where I've been triggered like that. Okay? I know in my mind's mind who I am. But you don't know who you are until you go through some trials and some temptations. And I was like, okay. Who knows? But what I do know is I take the lesson. Be very careful to judge and say that you would never because you don't know yourself like that. So what am I saying? People of God, we judge, yes, okay, making sound judgments. But what we do want to think about is why are people doing what they're doing? Let's take a look at motives because I feel like we fell in that arena. And first, before you go on this bandwagon or judging people's motives, I'm talking about you. Again, we said oppression happens on three levels. And I'm inviting you to first uh, look at yourself, okay? Because one of the reasons why people uh, experience relational oppression is because they are first uh, internalizing oppression, okay? They first internalize it. So if you build up your level of self-esteem, your level of self-respect. Many of you who have a very low dial on self-respect is the very reason there's lots of relational oppression. There has to be self-respect for this to go down like this. This is how it works. In K people award, it works like that. All right. So as well as you get in the Bible, which is great. Okay. But we also want you whole. Okay, we want you taking care of your soul, okay, your mind, your will, and emotions, all right? This is important because anybody can use the Bible to tie you up and hem you up, okay, and put you in the cult like I had experienced, okay? So these levels of self-respect for you, you have to build that. You've got to build your levels of self-esteem, and it comes from your self-image, how do you view your image? And that is where the labels come in. Do you see through the labels of man? Have you internalized the labels of society? And how much has that affected you? Okay. Look at Joseph. He was in, he was taken. He was a slave. Daniel even. They stripped their names off. They taught them languages. Moses even. Okay. But still they carried, they carried in their heart their faith. They believed in the Lord, their God, and they carried on his ways. They understood his thoughts towards them, okay, was of good and not of evil. They understood that they were wonderful and fearfully made, okay, that they were made in the likeness and the image of God. They understood that and they ran with that. And so it doesn't matter which environment you're in, you must do the internal work first. Build you and God will be able to build a city around you, okay? Amen. That you'll be able to lead others, okay? That you'll be able to lead others in the way that you are going after Christ, okay? That you're an imitator of Christ, that you'll be able to build others in the same fashion. Amen, amen. Listen, if this blessed you, say so, <laughs> okay? If this blessed you, say so. All right. Let the people say it was a blessing. If this teaching was blessed, you can feel free to sow into it. Um, my cash up is dollar sign, uh, mercy and Aaron. And the end is just an N. Okay. Amen. All right. So tomorrow, hopefully we'll have my co-host, Apostle James Duncan. He will be here and we're going to be continuing on this um, topic, celebrating Black History Month and the contribution of um, black folks. And let me tell you something, it's going to get hot, okay? Because let me tell you something, quite frankly, I was hot when I saw some of the contributions of black folk in Christendom and they don't get highlighted. Like, how did I not know that? It was like two years ago. I don't know. Everything must have happened around 2020, the year 2020. It was two years ago. I was like, 
we always talk about those events, but nobody ever told me these people are black in, in the body of Christ. Okay, so uh, why does that make a difference? It makes a different representation. I want to see myself. I want to see myself in the 19th century, the 18th century. I want to hear about these people that was moving and shaking. I want to see it. I want to hear about it. And I want them to be highlighted. I don't want them to, the work to be highlighted and not their names. And we didn't know that they were black. Why are they being hidden in the first place? I was appalled. But um, we're going to bring some of that out. Okay. All right. So I hope this is blessing you all. Um, we would love to see you. We have church service this coming um, Sunday at 10.30 a.m. at uh, the Clarion Hotel in West Springfield. We'd love to have you there. And before I go out, I better make sure. Listen, for you that's watching me now, if you have not given your life to Christ, I want to invite you. I want to invite you to give your life to Christ. Okay? And so I want you to do that by just following after me this very simple prayer, okay? You that's wondering and saying, is there a place for me? I have been so downtrodden and stigmatized by various different labels. I don't even know how to come out from underneath these labels. Let me tell you something. Jesus is the breaker of labels and stigmatization. He himself was rejected, okay? And a man of sorrows. And so he knows exactly how that feels. And so we're going to pray this morning. I want you to repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I am a sinner and I'm coming to you because I need a savior. I'm asking for your blood to cover my sins. And Father, I forgive those that hurt and wounded me. And I thank you, God, that you're forgiving me even right now. And so I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is my personal Lord and savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you said that, let me know. Inbox me. Let me know because I want to support you and I want to celebrate you. Trust and believe. Heaven rejoices. Heaven rejoices. And so uh, we thank you for your participation here. I see Minister Rosetta all the way from the UK, from London. It's good to see you from my birthplace. Good to see you, Woman Award. It's good to see you. Sister Lorna, it's good to see you also. We appreciate you. And here is the information where you can come and visit. This is CCI, Christchurch International, Springfield. Oh, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. I'm going to tell you a little secret. Let me tell you this. Apostle's coming out with a book. Okay. Apostle, did you hear me? Apostle's coming out with a book. I want everybody to support him. Okay. Support him. Okay. Let him know that he's loved. He's well supported. You're going to love the book. I have read the book. In fact, I am publishing the book. But when we release it um, next week, I want you guys to rush your orders, okay, and give them a good surprise. Okay, I hope he's not even listening right now. But anywho, okay, I want us to do something special for him this month, okay? So if we can just rush order and get those books, I want him to feel some type of specials, okay? And so uh, let's 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 bless him. Okay, let's bless him. We we don't want him to feel dishonored. We want him to feel blessed. All right. So let's do that for him. All right. So it's coming up next week. Make sure you put your funds aside. Okay, it's like 20 bucks, I believe, 20, 25, including shipping and handling. But anywho, um, please. Oh, and it's more if it's international, um, because of the postage and package, depending on where you are. Okay. All right, I'm out, people of God. It was good. It was great being here. I felt kind of naked in the beginning, like exposed because I was on my own. <laughs> but, um, oh, Jesus, let me get off. It's 43 minutes. Bye. Shalom. Shalom, people of God. Shalom. Shalom. God bless.